I know, right? With all this hair, it's just like, whew. <laughs> all I know is all the winters that I spent in the Army with short hair, my head was cold. This year, it's not. Must be a God thing. <clears throat> okay, turning your Bibles to Mark chapter 16. We're going to finish up the Gospel of Mark, and this is kind of bittersweet. It's always... Uh, well, it's nice to finish a teaching series and, and be done with it and put it to bed and uh, move on to the excitement of the next one. But, uh, you know, for this particular thing, saying goodbye to Mark is like uh, saying farewell to an old friend. Mark, Mark's gospel is my favorite of the four gospels. Uh, when I first started getting into, I guess, ministry, if you want to call it, teaching Bible stuff, um, I did a Bible study. We went through the Gospel of Mark. That was like 2006 or seven, something like that, um, which shows you just how. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, let me see. What's the, what's the proper adjective for us? Uh, faithful and trusting in God that Frank was, because he was the pastor that let me lead that. It's like, yeah, sure, go ahead. <laughs> anyway, uh, so we're wrapping it up today, and. Uh, made it through that. So uh, if you have a Bible, turn into it to uh, Mark chapter 16. If you need a Bible, then uh, we've got some on the cart there. You can you know, grab one or we'll hand one out to you. Just raise your hand. But how are you all doing this morning? Great. You guys want to start with a little prayer? Okay, great. Take out your 10 most wanted cards from last week. T 10 most wanted, the, the people that you commit to pray, 10 people to know Jesus. We, we, we'll pray for mine. Okay. Father God, thank you for this beautiful day, Lord, and uh, lift up to you uh, P-C-T-E-D-E-D-E-M-O-R-P-D-M-J-D-N-S-G -E 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 and A-S. Lord, that's actually 11, but uh, Lord, you put those people in my life, and so I lift them up to you, Father, that uh, they may encounter the risen Christ, that they may see their lives uh, as one needing Jesus, that they may see their sins for what they are, that they may see the forgiveness that you offer through your son, Jesus Christ. May they turn from those and turn towards you and enter into a relationship with you that lasts not just today, but for eternity, Father. I pray that you will save them, that you will either empower me to have that discussion with them or someone else in their lives to bring the gospel to them, Lord, and that their eyes would be open, their ears would be open, and their heart would be softened, and that they would be saved, Lord. I pray for this earnestly and fervently. And Father, I pray for today as we are here wrapping up the Gospel of Mark. Father, seeing the different ways that you're working in people's lives in this congregation, to you be the glory. Pray your blessing upon this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I didn't want you to feel guilty or bad. Thank you for helping me pray for my people. Uh, be sure and pray for your people. There's more of these cards at the information kiosk if you need one uh, to refresh your list. Put one in every book that you have and pray for those people because it's not going to be uh, your wittiness, it's not going to be your knowledge of the Bible, it's not going to be um, you persuading them, it's going to be God's work in their lives and the way that we empower, not empower, sorry, God is powerful, uh, the way that we can help and partner with God in working in their lives is through prayer. Prayer, prayer, prayer. We need to pray. Amen? All right, yeah, let's remember our Baptist roots. All right, the Gospel of Mark, uh, Raising Faith in Action is the title of this message because we're talking about Jesus Christ being raised from the dead, and we're talking about raising our evangelistic temperature, meaning our concern for those people that don't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, and uh, helping to see them come into that saving relationship. So chapter 16 is the last chapter of the Gospel of Mark. Here we go. When the Sabbath was passed... Uh, remember, Sabbath is the day of rest. They're not supposed to do anything, so they've got to wait for that to pass. Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. Uh, these three women were also at the crucifixion. They were there. They saw him die. They followed uh, Joseph of Arimathea. They saw where Jesus was buried, and um, they didn't have an opportunity to anoint his body for burial, as was the custom at the time, because things had to happen quickly before sundown and the Sabbath began. So uh, after the Sabbath is over, they go to finish the job. Very early on the first day of the week, 
when the sun had risen, so we know sunrise, so we know it's the first day they can go, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. <clears throat> so it's funny that uh, he's, well, okay. First off, it's ridiculous. If, you, if, if this were a myth that you were making up um, to try and say that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus had been raised from the dead, uh, if this in the first century was something that you were trying to lie about, it's ridiculous to show women going to the tomb, to have women be the ones who discovered the empty tomb. Uh, because a woman's testimony in, in Jewish law was nil. It, it, you know, women at the time were second-class citizens, although we see throughout Jesus' ministry how important women were to him. Uh, again, Jesus radically changed everything. But if you really wanted this to be a, a believable myth, you would have Peter... Uh, you would have, you know, because Peter is, was the leader of the church later on, you would have, you know, something else. Somehow, somebody else would be the one to discover that the tomb was empty. But to have women do it shows that it's true. Um, because the, it, you would have been laughed at. Uh, but you're basing your, your faith on this empty tomb, on the risen Christ, uh, upon the testimony of women. Um, so, and love these women, they're there when all the disciples had fled, and they're there watching him be crucified, they're, they're there uh, when they see him buried, they're the first ones there to see the empty tomb, and they're in their haste, they want to go, they want to anoint the body, they want to do what's right uh, for their, their Lord, and they don't even think about, oh gosh, that's a, that's a really big rock that's covering the entrance of that tomb, how are we going to move that? They're like already on the way, oh, Maybe we should have brought some of the guys. Yeah, I don't know. And then, oh, well, look, it's open. And so they go inside, and here's this guy sitting in white. Uh, the other gospels say it's an angel. Uh, one of the other gospels said that there's a man on the left and the right. Um, what's the difference? Different perspectives, different eyewitnesses, different people telling the story. Uh, but Mark says there's this man in white there, uh, and he uses the word for young man, not for angel. And, and he says, what, you, what are you all looking for? Looking for Jesus? Not here. See, that's, that's where he was, but he's not here anymore. He is risen. Go and tell the disciples and Peter, and Peter, Peter, the guy who denied Jesus, right? Peter, the guy who turned his back on Jesus after saying, I'll go with you to the death, well, or until they ask me around the campfire three times. Uh, but let Peter know Jesus wants Peter to know, it's okay. I will even meet you who turned your back on me. Go tell the disciples and Peter that I will meet them in Galilee. They're in Jerusalem right now. Uh, but he says, go and tell them, and I'll meet them in Galilee. Then you'll see him just as he told you. Jesus said, I will rise from the dead on the third day. They went out and fled from the tomb, trembling in astonishment had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Now, throughout this whole time, remember, we've talked about how uh, the demons cried out, you're the son of God, and he'd say silence, and the demons were obedient, and they wouldn't say anything more. Uh, he would heal the blind people, he'd heal the lepers, he'd say, go uh, take care of this, but don't tell anyone that I did it, and they went out and told people and hindered his ministry. And, and here he tells his disciples, his followers, Go tell them, and they don't. Such a contrast of, of how people react. <clears throat> For they were afraid. So I know you're asking, okay, well, what about verses 9 through 20, right? How many people's Bibles have verses 9 through 20? Yeah, most of them do. Mine actually does, but let's talk about that. If you read verses 9 through 20 and look at all the rest of the Gospel of Mark, you'll see a dramatic change in the way things are written. Um, 
and the natural flow of things. He'd already talked about how early in the week the, the, things, the sun had risen, the women went out, and then verse 9 says, Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had kept. There's a subject change. In the first eight verses, he's talking about the women, and all of a sudden now in verse 9, he's talking about Jesus and how he appeared to Mary Magdalene. Well, where did he appear? Anyway, so you see it's an awkward subject change. It doesn't really fit. Um, basically, verses 9 through 20 were not written by Mark. <sighs> but they're in the Mark's gospel. Why are they in Mark's gospel? Uh, church tradition. Here's, here's a couple of things, okay? First off, we'll just assume. Assume with me. I know what you say when you assume, but... Um, examine verses 9 through 20 and you say okay that's that's clearly not Mark's writing so what happened why did Mark stop at verse 8 so here's a couple of things either Mark had a different ending right he continued on after verse 8 and it was lost uh, like it was the last page they, uh, there was a thing called codexes which uh, were like our books today. Normally things were written on a scroll, then they'd switch to a codex, which is pages put together. And so uh, one theory could be that he had a different ending and it, that back page fell off. Uh, but if that's the case, if it happened early enough, word would have gotten back to Mark. There would have been a bunch of copies made of this. Um, and so he could have rewritten it. Um, then that ending would have had to have been lost on all the copies that were existing at the time. Okay, so... That's kind of not really plausible that there was something and that it was lost. So we'll set that aside. Second thing is, maybe Mark wanted to write more. Maybe he's in the middle of writing his gospel. He gets to, to verse 8. By the way, the chapters and verses, they were added much, much later. Okay? Um, he, he just wrote one continuous story. All the writers did. The, the chapters and verses were added later on to make it easier for us to study the Bible. So, so there could be that he wanted to continue writing but for some reason was unable to. Maybe he was arrested, maybe he was killed, and never got a chance to finish it. And so it, we just have what ended there. Um, and then later on in history, how did we get 9 through 20? Well, some scribe who was copying this gospel said, wow, that's not really a good ending. This guy didn't know what he was doing. Let me tell the rest of the story, because that's what he does. You know, It's like uh, he was rose, and he saw these people, and Mary Magdalene went and told people, and uh, he appeared to the disciples. Uh, all these things, by the way, in verses 9 through 20, with one exception, are in other Gospels, other parts of the Bible, uh, in Acts and in, in the other uh, Gospels. The two disciples that he appears to in verses 12 and 13, those are the two on the road to Emmaus. That's in another uh, Gospel where they're walking along and they're like, oh, geez, Jesus is the risen Jesus is walking with them. And they're like, don't you know what happened? You know, Jesus did all this stuff. And and they sit down and, and eat dinner, and Jesus goes, don't you guys realize all these things had to happen? And explains to them, and then he breaks bread, and they're like, oh, it's Jesus, and he disappears. Um, so that, that happened. It's recorded in another thing. Uh, and then it says, afterward, in verse 14, he appeared to the 11 themselves, were reclining at a table. He rebuked them. He, they did that. Uh, and then, you know, all these things that he s says, uh, he says somewhere else. And so, so that's why it's okay that 9 through 20 are in there, um, because it doesn't, it doesn't contradict anything. It doesn't rewrite the gospel. It doesn't change anything. Most of those things are recorded elsewhere. The only other thing is that where it says, uh, these signs will accompany me, accompany those who believe this in verse 17. In my name they will cast out demons. Yeah, they did that. Speak in new tongues. Yeah, they did that. Uh, they will pick up serpents with their hands. Um, Paul did that in the book of Acts after the shipwreck. Uh, they build a fire on the beach and an asp comes out and bites him. Uh, read the book of Acts. Basically, uh, he doesn't die. He should have died. Everyone thought, oh, he's a, he's a condemned man, and the shipwreck didn't kill him, so God is striking out with this snake to kill him, but he doesn't die, and so what's the next natural reaction? Well, he must be a god, and so they start treating him like a god, and so he preaches the gospel, people are saved. Uh, if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. That's, that's not recorded anywhere in the New Testament, people drinking poison and surviving. Not saying that it didn't happen in history by the time this was written down, but that's not recorded elsewhere in the New Testament. That's the only other thing. Uh, they will lay hands on the sick. They will recover. Those things happen. So uh, it, it's not bad that that's in there. It's just not part of what Mark wrote. So uh, either what he wrote was lost, or he wasn't able to finish, or he intended to finish it at verse 8. And a lot of people are believing that more and more, and uh, I think that that is true too. 
it, that it ends at verse 8, because think about who he's writing to. He's writing to the Romans who are suffering persecution, the Roman Christians, right? And, and they're scared because if they start telling people about Jesus, they're going to be arrested, they're going to be tortured and stuff. And so Mark's writing this to encourage them that Jesus is the Son of God, to encourage them in their faith. Think about the times that, you know, they stumbled and fell, and, and they're thinking, gosh, you know, I, I betrayed Jesus. Um, will I be forgiven? Well, Peter betrayed Jesus. Peter turned his back on Jesus, and he was forgiven. Uh, you know, what if I don't share my faith with others? Well, geez, Mary and Mary and Salome went out and fled from the tomb for trembling and astonishment and seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. So they read that and go, wow, these people who were there walking with Jesus, saw Jesus die, saw him buried, saw the empty tomb, these eyewitnesses uh, to Jesus rising from the dead were also scared, just like I'm scared. But I know that they didn't keep their mouths shut forever because here I am, you know, years later, and I know the story that he rose from the dead, that he appeared first to Peter and then the 12 and then to 500 other people and that's in uh, 1 Corinthians. So Mark's audience is scared, just like these women were scared, and so he's writing to encourage them and say, it's okay uh, that you're scared. The message will get out, and it's up to you now, as a believer, to get that message out. Um, and so ending at verse 8, I think, is okay, because the gospel is still delivered. In, in verses 6 and 7, uh, actually put 1 Corinthians up there, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, this is what Paul wrote to the Corinthian church. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. And it continues on. And then to 500 others, some of who have fallen asleep, but most are still alive. So as Paul's writing this to the church in Corinth, he's saying, this really happened. There were eyewitnesses. Don't take my word for it. Go talk to these 500 people who saw him. Believe it. And in verses 6 and 7 of chapter 16, he says, The man in white says to the women, Do not be alarmed. You see Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. Okay? The, the key to the gospel, died, buried, raised. Uh, who was crucified, died. He is risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him in this burial tomb. Died, buried, raised. But go tell his disciples and Peter he's going before you to Galilee. Um, so the gospel is all there, ending at verse 8, and it leaves this, this impression of urgency. And again, Mark's gospel is all about immediately this happened, immediately this. Jesus is a man of action. He went out, he healed people, he raised people from the dead. He himself said that he would die and be raised from the dead, and he was. And yeah, it's a little scary. Yeah, it's a little intimidating. Yeah, you're going through some difficult things. But so did he. So did the people that were with him at the time. Be encouraged by that and go tell people about Jesus. Go tell. Mark 16, 7. But go tell. Those are imperatives, they are commands. This man in white, this angel, is speaking on behalf of Jesus to his disciples. Go, don't just sit here, go and tell. Go and tell on your bulletin. There's a fill in the blank, a rare thing for me. Go and tell. Those are the commands that were given to the women. Now, think about this. If, if the women who were scared and fled the tomb and were in trembling and didn't tell anyone, if they had never told anyone... Would the empty tomb have been discovered? Would it have been known about? Or would the disciples just have sat there in mourning like they were doing when the women came back and said, hey, guess what? It, it's empty. And, and we learned that they did. In the Gospel of John, uh, Peter and John have a foot race, and John wins, although Peter... <laughs> sorry, I uh, was thinking of a skit guys thing. Anyway, John says... <laughs> that uh, Peter and the disciple whom Jesus loved ran back to the tomb, and the disciple whom Jesus loved beat him. Uh, in essence, that's a paraphrase. But anyway, so they run back, they look in the tomb, it's empty, and they have this astonished response as well. And we know that through church history, they preached the gospel. They went and they told. So uh, the women obviously did not stay silent forever. They shared the story of the empty tomb. Uh, they did what they were told, go and tell. And this is something that we 
should do, go and tell. Uh, since we're here talking about going and telling, let me uh, share you, uh, since uh, I came here, I went this morning, uh, let me tell you about my loved ones. And there's a method of my madness, not just to get you to like me more. Um, this is my favorite baby picture of my daughter, Faith. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, she was quite a handful, so we had this contraption put on her with a little handle to, to easily transport her around. <laughs> she was born with hip dysplasia, uh, which means that her left hip socket was not properly formed. It was basically dislocated, and there wasn't really a socket there for that ball joint to fit into. <laughs> Uh, it runs in my family. It's my fault. I take full responsibility for it. Both my sisters suffered from it. I had some kind of other thing going on. Uh, but because of this, uh, we alerted the doctor. And so when she was six months old, he discovered it. And we went to Shriners. And she spent 12 weeks in a body cast. <laughs> from here to her ankles. And so that was the first one. Uh, the second one was better because it didn't have the bar, and so she just fit nicely on your hip and was easy to carry around, you know. Uh, if you have kids or had kids, you know how they crawl and squirm. Well, it's a lot easier if you take out those bottom two uh, legs, you know. It's just like, uh, you can grab all you want, but I got you. Um, so she's smiling, she's laughing. That was a fun thing for her and Daddy to do uh, a couple of times. Um, but, you know, I love her. She's, she's a wonderful child. Uh, God has blessed me with her. Her name is Faith because... There were a lot of concerns about um, just everything, the pregnancy, and uh, we weren't supposed to be pregnant, but it happened, and uh, I wasn't this emotional back then. I was just confident that uh, God, you know, no matter what happened, God would get us through it, and I had faith in that, and so... That's how she ended up with that name. Um, but she is a, a wonderful little girl. Uh, she accepted Christ at VBS. I baptized her when she was seven. She's my loved one. Now this next picture is my favorite picture, childhood picture of me and my son. Uh, it's in Monterey. It was back when he still looked up to me and thought that I knew more than he did. And so I was explaining <laughs> to him things in the tide pool there and you know, just this bonding time of us being together. Uh, he is also a wonderful young man now, um, away at college, coming home next week, and I'm just immensely proud of him and, and who he has become in spite of me being his father. <laughs> um, so uh, he is also my loved one, and uh, he was baptized the same day I was in 2003. Now, this, uh, this next picture is a picture of all of us. It was taken by Whiteley Photography, Clay Whiteley, who goes to church here. Uh, me and my wife and son and daughter, all of us there. Nice, wonderful fall day. I didn't, yeah, yeah, it was, uh, I was in the army then, so I didn't have to, I couldn't have hair, but see how ugly I am that way and how much better I look. With... <laughs> anyway, so that was a nice day out at uh, William Land Park taking pictures and uh, we, you know, we do things together as a family and love each other and play games and do all kinds of wonderful things and uh, not often enough we pray together and not often enough we read the Bible together but we do those things sometimes we come to church together and uh, our life has been completely changed because of this next loved one of mine that's my favorite picture of Jesus because of Jesus I am here today because of my relationship with Jesus whom I love because he first loved me. Before I was born, before I committed my first sin, he died as payment for those sins. And because of him, I not only am, or I should say I not only want to be, but I am a better man than I would have been, than I was. And although I don't physically see a man, Jesus, someday I will. But I see Jesus in the smile of my friends who know him also when they greet me. I hear Jesus in their words of encouragement. I feel Jesus in the hugs that they give me and the love that they share. And so 
when we're commanded to go and tell, here's the thing. How many of you have kids or grandkids? How many of you have brothers or sisters or cousins and stuff? We tell people about our loved ones, right? We share pictures. Hey, see the latest picture of my grandkid? We tell people about our loved ones. If Jesus is one of your loved ones, I would encourage you to tell people about him also. We should tell people about Jesus. And so the weekly thought and the next step, this is a short message, but we're not done. The weekly thought, what is my Jesus story? Now last week I asked you to prepare your Jesus stories and what that meant was how has Jesus worked in your life? Um, you know, what changes has he made? Uh, I was a rotten person, I tell you. Um, you may not believe that. <laughs> or maybe you know me and you can believe that. Um, but I've definitely changed. And the next step is to go and tell someone your Jesus story. But what we're going to do right now is see a little video about something that's going to be started here that we're working on uh, that's going to change lives. Now, that's what we want. We want to see people's lives changed by the power of the gospel. So they're going to share some stuff, but basically, uh, (laughs) this is something that we're doing because it's needed. I thought it was loud enough. <laughs> okay, um, first off, I, I want to apologize to all of you, those of you who've seen me up here last time that was going to introduce the Celebrate Recovery program. And I got up here after thinking I was going to do it my way. And then I went home and read the program and found out we do it God's way here. And so, and amen to that. And so I just wanted to, to let you know that the way we do it is we have a good pastor, we have a good congregation, and together we make it work. Um, just a little bit about me, I want to let you know that I was raised in a military home. Materialistically, I wanted for nothing. Wanted for nothing. But um, we were very dysfunctional. We had a lot of physical abuse growing up. And, but I know now that my, that my mom did the very best that she could with what she knew as a child. And, you know, the stuff that we are given, you know, there's no books for this thing as far as being a parent and how we live life today. So we do the very best and and take the good with us, we hope, and try to leave the bad. Um, And so if we're lucky, we do that. I was a very good student. I was on drill team. I was a cheerleader. I played softball all of my life before graduating at 18 years of of age. I had the same boyfriend because the first guy who showed me what love was, I hung on to him forever. And so I hang on to him. I hung on to him all during my high school years. And... uh, Shortly after graduation, we got married, and I was four months pregnant. That's Five months later, I delivered to my oldest daughter. Her name is Gina, and I remember looking at her for the first time and knowing there was a God. After delivering her, I went, well, you know, Dad, is, there's got to be a God to do that, to, have, to look in their eyes and see that baby, right? I tell you this because I loved her so very much. And she was barely four months old. I went out to a club celebrating, getting back into my, my real jeans. And um, my girlfriend at the time offered me a line of methamphetamine. I did that line that she offered me. I wasn't raised to do that, but I did it. I don't know why. And from that day forward, I did it every single day. So even though I was immensely in love with that daughter of mine, that brand new baby, this drug took me away from her immediately. I may have been there physically, but emotionally, my mind was set on the next bag, the next fix. I used nonstop for the next 10 years. I was lucky that my parents took over my daughter, took care of her, because any other world, it would have been a CPS case, for sure. My addiction took me to all the places I never thought I'd be. At the end of my using, I got away with nothing, and I found myself in jails, institutions, and I even experienced death. I knew I had, that something had to change and I had to try something different. I found a recovery home here in Sacramento, February 7th, 1995. Stayed in there, it was a 90 day program They kept me for 18 months. Some of us are sicker than others. And <laughs> that place introduced me to AA and both of those places saved my life at the time. I'm still grateful for both of those programs. But eight and a half years later, I, I relapsed. I thought I was doing everything right. It's according to the program I was. 
So I got sober again. I, I went to a detox, came out, went to AA, spent every day in AA all day long. A and it worked. I stayed sober. I'm, I stayed dry. I stayed, I stayed off the drugs. But I just didn't have that feeling in my heart anymore like I did the first time around. I was sad. So here I was walking around without the drugs in my system, but not feeling good that I was without the drugs in my system. My friend Lori, she's also one of our members here, and I had been talking about going back to church. We both grew up knowing God, and we were missing our faith. And I, and I knew there was something missing, and I believe this today to be that that was God calling me, you know, in this direction. Lori found this church next door over there. We went there once. It wasn't a good fit. Um, we came over here the next week, and we've been here ever since. It was a family as soon as we walked in. I, I love this. I love this church. I love you guys, all my, my church family. We both made, uh, became members immediately, and now we attend every Sunday. After coming here just for a very short time, I figured out there was still something wrong with my sobriety, and that was my relationship with our Lord and Savior. Ever since that first time I, I accepted God into my life, my sobriety had gotten stronger. At that time, I was missing one thing, and I figured it out. That was God. I only needed him. Every week, I continued to write my interests in, in our program at the very bottom of what we turn in every week. And one day, Pastor Mike asked me if I was interested in helping start the Celebrate Recovery program here in our church, and I just knew that was God's plan for me. I, my heart immediately filled. So I was and am honored to bring this program to our church and to share it with my, my church family. I was blessed to attend the, CR, the Celebrate Recovery Conference down in Southern California with Will at the Saddleback Church, and I witnessed like 10,000 people wanting, running around using Celebrate Recovery for their hurts, hang-ups, and habits, and, it, and I cried. It was amazing to see all these people using our, our, our Lord and Savior as their, as their direction to stay sober, or whether, whether that be their hurt, hang-up, whatever their hurt, hang-up was. So it's not only about addiction and, you know, drugs and alcohol. You've seen that on the, uh, up there on the, up there. <laughs> As a matter of fact, there is, there is only, not only that, that we found that many churches do not have a pastor with their Celebrate Recovery program, and that's a lot of reason why they fail. And I want you to know that Pastor Mike has been the one to initiate this program, and that he has been our greatest fan every step of the way. So we are very lucky. We are very lucky. We found out that the fact that a lot of them do not, do not succeed because they don't have a pastor to back them up. They're afraid to let those people, you know, be in their, in their church, and we don't have that today, so we're very blessed. I've been sober since January 23rd, 2007, and my true happiness and peace didn't start until two years ago, participating here at, at uh, Antelope Springs Church with God as my co-pilot. My hopes are to find others in our, in our church family with unresolved hurts, hang-ups, and habits and that want to be a part of our solution today. We have a great family here. Please join us to make this the best Celebrate program ever. Thank you. I'm a little, ner I'm a little nervous, so um, my name's Will, and I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ, and I'm here because of his grace, mercy, forgiveness, and love. Um, what you don't know about me is that I was raised in church my whole life. In college, in the outside world, I saw very evil. It shook me to my core, force, forcing me to confront things I was not prepared for. I lost my way. Shaky. There we go. Okay. Um, I was popular and successful. I held down great jobs, traveled around the world, and was a world-class athlete. No one knew that on the inside I had deep hurts, bad habits, and emotional hang-ups that were destroying me. I was confused and unhappy. I knew I needed Christ, but... In church, I felt very ashamed of being addicted. You may be lost, and like me, I knew I needed help. I believed in and loved God. It was hurting. I looked for a step-by-step -step plan somewhere to guide me out of my problems in my life. I tried 12-step programs. They worked for temporarily, but the idea that I was never to be rid of my disease just threw me emotionally back under the bus. I was not connecting. I did not want to drag guilt and condemnation around with me for the rest of my life. That is when I discovered Celebrate Recovery. I found the step work I needed to walk out my, work out my 
practical day-to-day -day life. I was able to overcome my misery through Christ. Most importantly, celebrate recovery is in agreement with God's word. Only with God did I find my way to peace, and I did recover. I am forgiven. I am a work in progress. In other words, like all Christians, I have been justified in God's eyes because I believed in his son. Christ has made me feel free from all my sin. I can be free from my old sin nature. I can recover, and you can recover too. Today I stand before you free from my hurts, habits, and hang-ups. Thanks to Celebrate Recovery, I have a step plan that does not take the place of my Christian walk, but rather keeps me on the path God intended for my life. I am a new creature in Jesus Christ. At CR, each one of us is here to help. We welcome all who need a plan. Our 12 steps and 8 Beatitudes bring us in touch with God to work out our hurts, habits, and hang-ups. The best part of this ministry is that we get to celebrate together. Credit for every success at Celebrate Recovery belongs, belongs only to God's mercy. All the glory for his program is God's alone, not mine. As a brother in Christ, I invite you to CR. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, Hello. I wanted everybody to know that we have pamphlets up here that have the information for CR, and we will be up at the front, okay? on the way out. Thanks, guys. Thank so, um, not, again, like Brenda said, those, some of the other programs, you know, help save her life and, and not to, to um, bash them at all, but, you know, it's different to say, hi, <laughs> sorry. Hi, my name is Mike and I'm an alcoholic and to have that label and never be able to get past that label versus, hi, my name is Mike, I have hurts, habits, and hang-ups, but I'm recovering from those thanks to the power of Jesus Christ. Amen? So um, it, it's a very successful program because it's very tried and true and tried all over the nation in thousands of churches, and so to be part of it and actually use the name Celebrate Recovery, like Brenda said, is a lot more. Uh, in January, we're going to start a, a group going through the steps. Um, people are welcome to go through that. Um, and, and also, we need to raise a leadership. And it's just like anything that we do. You know, we do a Sunday morning service, but we need a worship leader. We need hospitality. We need someone to speak. We need someone to greet. We need teams to do it. And so to get this going, it's like having another service, and we're going to do it on Saturday nights. Uh, the goal is to begin in July. Saturday nights, because there's no other place around in this area that has it on Saturday nights which means that it, it, everything is working for it to be a very successful thing. Uh, and it's not just something that I went, gee, that's great, we can do that, and we get extra people, and blah, blah, blah. It was, seeing Brenda's communication card, I want to help, I want to do this, you know, uh, substance abuse, recovery, blah, blah, blah. At the same time, I get this thing from Celebrate Recovery in the mail going, hey, you know, here's a discount on the package, and I'm like, oh, these two must work together. And then as she's figuring it out, Will comes along and goes, hey, I'm already in it, I'm, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and so it just all worked together. It was a God thing is basically what I'm saying. It wasn't, it wasn't Pastor Mike going, we need this program. Uh, it was a God thing saying, uh, I want this program at my church. God saying that. So uh, see Will and Brenda, they got the shirts, and, uh, it, and yeah, they, they, went to the, they went to the conference, got the shirts, the whole thing, right? Um, <laughs> Anybody else uh, have a powerful testimony uh, about how Jesus is working in their lives? It's all right. We can save it for the 28th. You guys can work on it a little bit. Oh, fantastic. Thank you, ma'am. The band can go ahead and, and head up to the stage to get ready for the closing songs. Good morning, everyone. Am I on? Yep. <clears throat> okay. My name is Gwen, and I'm just visiting your family here. And I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to come and worship with you. I just recently moved to the area, so I'm looking for a church home. But I want to say that, um, you know, God has walked with me every step of my life. I just didn't realize it. I was a single parent. I raised my sons alone. I'm now a great-grandmother, which I'm very proud of. But uh, I remember when I, I had a very abusive marriage, so I got divorced. And I remember when I got divorced and I turned to my mother and I said, now what the heck do I do? Um, what do I do with these kids? Where do I go from here? 
And my mother looked at me, and she said, you go pray. And I thought, cool. <laughs> what do I go pray about? And God had such a wonderful sense of humor. He knew I didn't have a clue as to what I was doing. But I sat down one day in my bedroom after I put my kids to bed, and I said, okay, now, you need to tell me what to do because I don't know what I'm doing. And he answered me. He sent me from Colorado to Augusta, Georgia to get away from the abuse that I was going through. I got on the Greyhound bus. I went to Augusta, Georgia with my two kids, put my last dime in the telephone to call my sister at the bus station and told her, you need to come pick me up because I don't have another dime to call you. And she was there to pick me up. So all along the way, God answered my prayer. I, six months there, I was able to move into a trailer and find a job. Six months after that, I was working for DuPont and was able to take care of my children, which was my goal. And, you know, it was a struggle, but prayer brought me through every step of the way. I did not think I was going to be able to raise my children, but I realize now it wasn't me alone. It was God with me every single step, and I used prayer to get me there. I didn't know how much until, <laughs> until my son went to his first tour of duty in Iraq, and I thought I was going to die. I thought, I can't live through this. I was a total zombie. So I immersed myself in work. By that time, I was an executive director for a nonprofit helping people with disabilities find employment. So I worked 24-7 to keep my mind off of everything and to keep going. Then his second tour of duty, I thought, oh, what is this? You know, And I was a total zombie. By the time his, his fifth tour of duty rolled around, I was a basket case. My health went to heck in a bread basket. And again, the only thing I could think to do was to just keep praying. And I realize now that God carried me through all of that. It wasn't me. Everybody kept saying, you're so strong. It wasn't me. It was God. He was carrying me the whole way. And he was carrying the load. So I retired in uh, January of this year. And by then, my health was pretty much gone. Uh, the doctors just recently had told me they wanted me in the hospital. And I said, no, I'm, I can do this. So I went to pray. And I prayed on my health. And I went to the doctor again last week. And the doctor said, I don't understand what's going on. You're completely different now. Well, you don't need to go in the hospital. Everything's coming under control. So I just wanted to, to say and to confess to everyone that it's God that carries us. Amen. If we turn to prayer, if we let go and let God do what he needs to do for us, we will be saved and we will be successful in whatever we're trying to achieve. Thank you for lending me your ear. All right, so that uh, we can head home on time so our roasts don't burn. <laughs> We're going to go ahead and receive the offering now and continue worship. And uh, again, uh, the 28th, uh, two weeks from today, uh, next week, by the way, is the Christmas program, the 21st, uh, as part of the overall services, the children's Christmas program. Uh, and then the 28th, we'll, we'll open mic some more. Uh, oh, sorry, we'll have a microphone. <laughs> We're not going to open me anymore. I've shared enough for the year. Uh, but uh, so let me uh, pray for the offering. If you're a guest with us today, please don't feel obligated uh, to give. But uh, this is the way we worship God, by giving back what he has blessed us with and continue to do the work of the ministry. So thank you, Lord, for this day, uh, for all the people that are here, for the wonderful testimonies, Lord, of how you've worked in people's lives and uh, how true it is that if we uh, turn to you in prayer, you're there for us. Uh, even when we don't turn, you're still there uh, guiding us, uh, pouring out your grace and mercy upon us 
but Lord, when we do turn to you, uh, even more so. And so thank you for that. Thank you for these tithes and offerings. May you bless and multiply them all for your glory, Lord. May you be glorified because you're worthy. We thank you and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen.